the last year, I've been caught up in a whirlwind photographing over 90 breeds of horse. In the course of making the book, uh, there's not many places I haven't travelled to. The UK, America, Iceland and Argentina, Dubai, India, Australia, China, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, Austria, Germany and Holland, Norway and Finland. Uh, finally, we visited Russia. We used everything. Planes, trains, buses, hire cars, horseback, definitely. If you think of something, we probably used it along the way. I had to be fairly creative to get different angles, but I think that is half the fun of what I do. I generally scout the area to see what was available, and what I could make work often surprised me. When I began my journey making The Majesty of the Horse, I had no idea what I was in for. From here in India, we were up in the uh, northwest in a region called Punjab. Aboha is a wonderful small village. It really is a wonderful place and totally off the beaten track. We were the only tourists there. We stayed with the family who owned Malwari horses. They are the most elegant horses. They sort of dance along. I couldn't stop taking pictures. There was just so much going on. It was quite short-lived because of the weather. The sun came up and the mist disappeared. And it was almost like, did that happen? But it was just so incredible. You can't travel with too much kit, so I didn't have any lighting gear. It was all natural light that I shot with, and that provides its own challenges. But at the same time, then, the pictures I produce as a result, I love even more because of the, the variables. We passed through Jaipur for a couple of days, and whilst we were wandering around the town, we came across this amazing local photographer. My name is Surandar. This camera is the 150-year-old camera. This camera is my grandfather's camera. This two minutes ready. He was just the nicest man, and it was it was humbling experience to spend the time with him. This finish, black and white. India is an incredible country. It's so diverse, and we didn't even scratch the surface. There's a lot going on at once. It's a total feast for the senses. We spent a little bit of time diverting from our route and we stopped in to see the Taj Mahal. The majesty of it, the size, the enormity uh, and a break from horses. When I wasn't on location I was editing photos from previous shoots, setting up my transportation and details for forthcoming shoots. There was always something to do that required my attention quite urgently so it was a challenge. We are going to the fort called Dundlod Fort, which is owned by Bonnie Singh. In the state times, Dundlod had nearly more than 200 horses. We had our own cavalries until my grandfather's time. The horses went out of Dundlod when my grandfather moved to Jaipur. It was in the 12th century that the Rathor rulers of the Marwad region, they started domesticating the animal and training it for battle. And because it was done in the Marwad region, the word Marwadi came into existence. Hello. It's always been, I would say, very highly spirited, very loyal to their owners, and a horse which is genetics needed for a battle horse. You can make him through traffic, through horns, through firecrackers, and the horse is not scared. <laughs> In India, they use the horses at weddings. It's just incredible to watch, to witness the horses sort of bringing the groom up through a street full of people and dancing and noise and music and colour and these horses are just honoured. We arrived in Sydney in late December and it was hot. It was roasting. Australia is an incredible country. Sydney life is vibrant and buzzing with lots of energy. 
the Australians love going to the races. We visited the Hunter Valley, which is an incredible area north of Sydney. We spent time meandering through the beautiful vineyards and took shelter in the shade away from the heat. We generally just took some time to stop and breathe, which was well needed after being on the road for so long. So we were there for three and a half weeks and it rained for the majority of that. We have a grim and desperate situation in the Toowoomba and Lockyer Valley region. The Australians were facing some of the most severe weather they've had for a long time. It was wet, it was dangerous, it was all over the news. The edge of the weather was on us all the time. It was horrific for the Australians. I experienced a lot of challenges because of the weather, the persistence of it. There was no break in it some days, so we were shooting in, in rain a lot. We spent a day with a whole lot of stock horses. It's great. And this was really rural, like cowboys, and it was a fantastic experience. These stock horses were also used for polo cross. Knowing horses really helped push the boundaries. There were moments where I would have been petrified. It didn't faze me at all but any onlooker, they would have thought she's crazy. <laughs> I went to find the Brumbies up in the snowy mountains. That was an amazing part of the adventure. I knew there were a lot of them around, but it was just a matter of being lucky enough to see them. I came up to the brow of the hill and saw a couple of horses grazing. I got really close, really close. They were not fast, they just did their thing. The Brumbies weren't a huge part of the book, but they're native to Australia. We travelled through Shanghai to Beijing, where Tamsin Pickerel, the author, joined us on the adventure. We took the opportunity to visit the Great Wall of China. about three days in Beijing preparing for Mongolia, buying supplies and preparing for the cold and the wilderness. It was a 33-hour train journey, give or take. There were four of us on the team going into Mongolia. No one really knew what to expect. None of us had been up into Mongolia before. It was extraordinary going from this, the main CBD where people are off working and doing, I say normal things, but um, going to the office. And, living and then suddenly you're out in rural Mongolia where there's nothing, nothing for miles and miles and miles. We're going to see some uh, eagle hunters and go horse riding and play in the mountains. Going out into minus 35 degrees and suddenly coming into a really warm gur where we'd be welcomed in by the local villagers and there'd always be a fire in the middle so you'd go from really cold to really quite warm and the cameras would mist up straight away and we'd we'd have to put them in a bag and, and so you're sort of dealing with that and then suddenly you're dealing with this whole culture at the same time and being offered tea with milk which is not quite what you're used to and uh, interesting sweets and biscuits and you're talking to them as best you can through an interpreter and they're also warm and friendly and they live this family life, which, I don't know, is a very unique bond, I think. Would I come again? Yeah. <laughs> Would I come again in winter? Yeah. <laughs> Am I looking forward to the next few days? Yeah. Uh, have I had enough? No. Arriving in the park when the sun was coming up was incredible. We had two days out there, but we needed to make the most of the light. The 
cold in Mongolia is something that I really should talk about because I've never photographed out in the wilderness like that where you're so far from anything. And preparing for that was interesting and we were researching online about taking kit to sub-zero temperatures. I'm losing my fingers. So there was not only keeping ourselves warm, there was keeping our cameras protected. We couldn't spend long outside of the vehicle because it was biting cold. We got ourselves um, sorted. We were staying in Gur that evening. We woke up around 6.30 and went out to look for the horses. We found some tacky quite soon and got out and started taking photos of them. You see these animals in books and on the television and documentaries and things like that. It's very rare that you actually get to go and see something that you've studied so much. The population has shrunk and so we're looking at a sizable part of the population of the only remaining Taki that there are. It's an amazing feeling to actually see it in the flesh. I enjoyed every minute of the challenge and I pushed myself pretty hard throughout and lost a lot of sleep over it. But I think that I look at the book now in a different way. I look at a book and I see the blood and the sweat and the tears and the laughter and it makes it even more of an amazing accomplishment. I constantly reflect back on the enormity of the task as well as the diversity of things that we did along the way. It was a challenging experience, but I wouldn't change it for the world. 